Our next lesson today is going to be on solutions. We're going to look at solutions four. Um, and in this top, in this lesson, we're going to look at three topics. We're going to look at colligative properties, which sort of is our overall, um, the topic for this lesson. And the particular colligative properties we'll look at will be at a freezing point depression and at boiling point elevation. So first, let's talk a little about colligative properties. So earlier in this unit, we talked about that if you add a solute to a solvent, that it will, whenever you do that, it changes some of the properties of the solvent. Um, we talked about, remember, with uh, you adding something into water, is that when you did that, is that it changes, say, the surface tension of the water, changes how well the water, you know, wets to surfaces. It changes the boiling point and the freezing point and what the vapor pressure is. And we talked about all those things. Um, and so, you know, decreasing the vapor pressure, the freezing point, and increasing the boiling point. And so we're going to look at two of these properties right here in this lesson. We're going to look at basically at changes the freezing point and changes the boiling point right here. Now, for these two things, the freezing point, the decrease in the freezing point, and an increase in the boiling point done by adding a solute to a solvent, is it turns out the degree to which these properties change depend only on the number of solute particles, not on the particle size or their mass or on what substance they are. And so if I have, you know, n number of particles of solute in a particular volume of solution, that that will have a certain boiling point. Whereas if I have a different type of substance, but I have the same n number of particles, it will have the same boiling point as the other one. Even though they're completely different substances, even though the solutes have completely different masses, even though those atoms or those molecules inside may have completely different sizes, it doesn't really matter what they are or how big they are. All that matters is what number of them there are. And so these types of properties, uh, such properties that depend only on the number of particles, but not on anything else, are called colligative properties. Uh, and turns out that our uh, freezing point change whenever we have a solution and our boiling point change when we have a solution are both colligative properties. They depend only on the number of particles of the solute, not on anything else about the solute. Now, we will find that there are some other issues that are involved here, uh, molarity, or sorry, molality and what the solvent is. But in terms of the solute, all that matters is how many product particles that you have. And so um, let's go ahead and take a look at the first of those right there, which is going to be on freezing point depression. So we've said before, the addition of a solute will lower the freezing point of a solvent. And it will lower it according to this equation that you see on the screen. Delta Tf is equal to M times Kf times I. Uh, looks like a fairly, not a long equation, but somewhat complex here. So let's look at the pieces here. First one we're going to take a look at is Delta Tf. And so Delta Tf is the freezing point depression. That is, it is the amount by which the freezing point of a substance drops whenever you add a solute to that substance. Um, and so it's the amount the freezing point decreases. The units gonna, we're going to use going to be degrees Celsius. Uh, Kelvin would work here, but usually when we talk about freezing points, uh, we're typically dealing with things that are in degrees Celsius, so we'll use that here. M right here, it's a lowercase m. And if you remember from what we did before, is lowercase m is molality. And so m is the molality of the solution, and it will be measured in molals, as we've discussed before. Kf. Kf is a constant. It is the called, we'll usually call it the freezing point depression constant. Sometimes you will hear a little more of this sort of technical sounding term, cryoscopic constant. Those are both exactly the same thing. Uh, and it's the freezing point depression constant of the solvent. And so the key thing about Kf is remembering that it is about the solvent. Um, is it has nothing to do with the solute, nothing to do with the solution overall. It's of the solvent. So different solvents have different values of Kf. For water, Kf is 1.86 degrees Celsius per molal. And so no matter what we mix into water, doesn't matter what the solute is, is that Kf for water is always going to be 1.86. If we were mixing into a different solvent, uh, into alcohol or, or, um, or something else, then it would have a different value of Kf than 1.86. But for water, it's 1.86 degrees Celsius per molal. Our last one here is I. I is called the Van Hoff Hoff factor. Um, Dutch guy, that's why he has this sort of weird name. But uh, basically the Van Hoff Hoff factor deals with this issue of the fact that we said this was a colligative property. Uh, and colligative properties had, are based on the number of pieces, not on what they are. And the Van Hoff factor, I, is the number of pieces into which the solute molecules will break. 
Now, we need to go into that in a little more detail, and that's what we're going to do in this next slide here before we get back to uh, working out some examples on our freezing point depression. And so let's take a look at the Van Toff factor. So finding the Van Toff factor I. If you have an ionic solute, so we're going to talk about ionic solutes to start with, ionic solute used molecules break apart into their constituent ions when dissolved, creating electrolytes. And so if I were to have something nice and ionic like NaCl, and so NaCl is ionic, and because of that, whenever it's going to break up, it's going to break up into our sodiums. Remember, the sodium is going to lose an electron, so it'll be positive, plus the chlorines, which are going to gain an electron, are going to be negative. So it breaks up into two ions. In this case, so for NaCl, the Van Toff factor is going to be simply equal to 2. Okay? So ionic substance, ionic solute molecules break apart into their constituent ions when dissolved and you have an electrolyte. The Van Toff factor is then the total number of ions in a molecule. So if we had BaCl2, this is going to break into one barium ion and two chlorine ions. And so for a total of, that shouldn't be two right there. That should be three. So let's get rid of that one right there. Uh, that should be a total of I equals three for this case because of the fact we have one barium and two chlorines. And so Van Toff factor for this first one is going to be three, BaCl2. If we have H2SO4, is that this is going to break up into three ions. The reason why is there are going to be two hydrogens, but this SO4. If you look at that SO4 right there, is that SO4 is sulfate. That's a polyatomic ion, and there's only one of them here. And so we have two hydrogens and one sulfate ion for a total of three. So it's one thing you need to watch out for is that whenever you're dealing with something that's an ionic substance, if it has a polyatomic ion, remember those polyatomic ions are going to break apart separately. They always travel together. And so H2SO4, two hydrogens, one sulfate for a total of three for your Van Toff factor. Um, Non-ionic solute molecules don't break apart at all. Remember, that's why they're not called non-electrolytes. Remember, is they don't break apart, they don't have ions, and so as a result, there are no positives and negatives to carry current through the solution. And if they don't break apart, then they'll simply have a Van Toff factor of 1. So they break into one piece. They really don't break at all. Uh, so looking at things, first thing you want to do if you're trying to figure something out is you want to identify is it ionic or not. And remember that typically ionic substances tend to be made of things that are basically one of the alkali or alkaline earth metals with something that's on the far right side of the periodic table. Well, not the far right, so it doesn't count the noble gases, but something like a halogen or in the same column as oxygen or something like that. Or it's a substance that has a polyatomic ion in it. If either one of those two things is true, you know it's going to be ionic and you're going to have to count the ions it breaks into. Things that are non-ionic tend to be things that come from sort of that section that's around um, column 4 in the periodic table, the one that uh, should be 4A, uh, the one that sort of has carbon around in it. So like carbon dioxide, CO2, is not ionic, and so it'll have a value of 1. I just gave away one of my examples down at the bottom. Um, so that's something that you do want to look out for there, is that uh, if it ever says it doesn't, collect, uh, doesn't conduct electricity, and the solution, you know it's a non-electrolyte. And if it's a non-electrolyte, that means it doesn't break into parts. And so as a result, it has a Van Toff factor of 1. So let's try to do some examples here. What is I for the following? So Na2O is our first guy right here. And so for this, so first question is, is this ionic? You look at sodium. Sodium is way over there on the left side of the periodic table. It is um, over in our, um, our alkalis alkali metals over there, and so that with an oxygen, which is over on the right side, this is definitely going to be ionic. We have two sodiums and one oxygen, so your total, your I value here is going to be three, okay? Carbon dioxide, uh, we already sort of talked about this one, but carbon and oxygen are both sort of next to each other in the middle here. Neither one of them um, particularly wants to give, wants to, uh, give up an electron, uh, and so as a result, this is going to be a covalently bonded thing. It's not ionic, and since it's not ionic, its I is going to be just 1. NH42S. In this case right here, NH4 is ammonium. That's a polyatomic ion. And we have two NH4s here, and we have one sulfur. And so I for this one is going to be basically 3. That is ionic. C6H14. This is a hydrocarbon. We have a carbon and a hydrogen here. Is that in general, all your hydrocarbons, things that are just made of carbon and hydrogen, and maybe carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, are not going to be ionic. They're all covalently bonded. Uh, so typically things that tend to start with carbon like this are, you could pretty much say 99.9% .9 of the time are going to be covalently bonded. Not ionic. 
And so I is equal to 1 for that. MgCO3. Ionic or not? Hint is CO3 is carbonate. And so polyatomic ion, we have one of those carbonates and one magnesium for a total I value of 2, like that. HCl, also ionic. Chlorine is over there in the halogen column. Definitely, definitely wants to steal an electron, and hydrogen's more than willing to give it up. And so we have one hydrogen ion and one chlorine ion for a total I value of 2 as well. And so that's how you go about working out and figuring out what the Van Hoff factor is for different solute, uh, different possible solutes here. So let's put that all together and uh, work out what we get for some freezing point depression stuff here. So what is the freezing point of a 0.5 molar magnesium chloride solution, MgCl2 solution? And so to set this up, we know we're going to write out our freezing point depression equation. Uh, and so it's delta Tf is equal to the molality times Kf, the freezing point depression constant, times the Van Hoff factor, like that. And so we're looking for delta Tf here. We don't know what that is. Equals the molality. The molality of the solution tells us right here it's 0.5. So we have a 0.5 molal solution. Kf is that uh, it doesn't say what the solvent is here, but for the most part, unless I tell you otherwise, you can assume the solvent's going to be water. And remember, for water, Kf is 1.86. So 1.86 degrees Celsius per molal times the Van Hoff factor, I. So MgCl2, is it ionic or is it covalent? Well, we just did it before, so we know it's going to be ionic. We have magnesium, an alkali earth metal with chlorine, a halogen. That chlorine definitely is going to want to steal one of magnesium's electrons, so this is going to be ionic. And since we have one magnesium and two chlorines, Van Hoff factor is going to be three. And so we have three right here for this. So if you get out your calculator then, and you basically go ahead and say that we have uh, 0.5, times, whoops, my calculator's being a little iffy here, so times 1.86 times 3. And when you do that, I get 2.79. And so in this case right now, my delta Tf is going to be 2.79 degrees Celsius. Now, it asks for not the change, but asks what the freezing point is. Now, water's normal freezing point is 0 Celsius. And this is a freezing point depression up here, which means that freezing point will be dropping. And so if it starts at zero, drops by 2.79, the temperature now, the new freezing point, will be negative 2.79 degrees Celsius. Since we started off, though, with 0.5, one significant figure here, um, then it means our final answer here for the freezing point is going to be negative 3 degrees Celsius. Um, just as a quick note here is that looking at significant figures, we said before on this that uh, our 0.5 has one sig fig right here. The 1.86 is a constant, that therefore it has infinite significant figures. The Van Hoff factor, your i right here, it's got to be a whole number. You can't really have a, can't say something breaks into two and a half pieces or something like that. And since it's got to be a whole number, it's basically a counting number, is that it's also considered to have infinite significant figures because the fact that is this about three? Does it break into about three pieces? No, it breaks into exactly three pieces. And so the only thing that's really going to affect our temperature calculations here is going to be that initial molality or whatever we have to do to figure out that molality, if uh, that's the case. So we get negative three degrees Celsius is our freezing point of our 0.5 molal magnesium chloride solution. So let's look at another one down here. How many moles ammonia must be added to 70 grams water to lower the freezing point by one degree Celsius? And so to set this up, we're going to say the same thing we did before. You know, delta Tf is equal to mkfi. And so do we know what the freezing point depression is? It says we're lowering the freezing point by 1 degree Celsius. So we know this guy is just 1 right here. The molality, does it tell us molality? It's, no, it really doesn't. It says how many moles, but we don't know that. So that's our molality times Kf. And so we have to look at what the solvent is. The solvent here is water. And so when it's water, 1.86 is our value for Kf times I. How many pieces are going to break into? So what's our solute? How many moles of ammonia? Ammonia is NH3. NH3, is this going to be ionic or covalent? If you look at it here, is that um, 
ammonia and nitrogen sort of towards the middle here. It's, uh, it's sitting over there in column, uh, 5A, uh, with hydrogen. If you notice, it's also one of those that's sort of out of order. You normally expect the hydrogen to be first. This is definitely going to be a covalent one. This is not an ionic substance. And since it's not ionic, it has an I value, a Vantoff factor of one. And so solving for this, if we want to solve for the molality, we'll divide both sides by 1.86. And so doing so, we get that the molality of this substance, if you break out the calculator, 1 divided by 1.86 ends up being 0.538 molal solution. And so uh, does this answer our question? The question is how many moles? Not yet. So we're going to have to say our molality, 0.538, we're going to put this into our molality equation. And remember that the molality of a substance is equal to the number of moles of that substance, which we don't know. So we're going to call x moles of ammonia on top, divided by the number of kilograms of solvent. And in this case, we have 70 grams of our water, of our solvent. And so 70 grams is 0.07 uh, uh, kilograms. And so to solve this here, we're going to multiply both sides by 0 0.07. So we take our 0.538, multiply times 0 0.07. Doing so, I get a total for x of 0 0.0, it's equal, 0 0.03766 moles of ammonia. Significant figures here, 70 grams has one sig fig. Our temperature has one sig fig, so we'll round this to one sig fig. So our final answer here is 0 0.04 moles of NH3 of ammonia. And so that is how you'd go about doing some freezing point depression calculations. All right, so let's go on then. Boiling point elevations, our next thing. Boiling point elevation works very, very similar to, similarly to freezing point depression. Um, just some different variables that are in there. If you look at the equation, it looks almost the same. The only difference really is we have some Bs where last time we had Fs. So the addition of a solute will raise the boiling point of a solvent according to the following equation. Delta TB equals M times KB times I. In this case right here, our, uh, our delta TB right here, the delta TB is the boiling point elevation. It's the amount the boiling point increases by in degrees Celsius. And so we talk about that delta TB. The delta, remember, means change. So change in the temperature of boiling. So that's what we have for that one. M, same as it was before. It's the molality. Uh, KB is the boiling point elevation constant. Sometimes it's called the ebullioscopic constant. That's the more technical term. But boiling point elevation constant is what I'll usually use, uh, or, or what we'll talk about in this class generally. So KB is the boiling point elevation constant. And it does, like KF, depend only on the solvent. And so for water, KB is 0.512 degrees Celsius per molal. Uh, different substances, of course, would have different uh, boiling point elevation constants. And so this is sort of what we've got for right here. I, once again, is our Vantoff factor. It works the same way as it did for, uh, for freezing point depression. And so breaks the number of pieces of the molecules, the solute molecules will break in two. So let's go ahead and let's work out a couple of these because we really don't need to spend a whole lot of time talking about something that looks exactly like the one we did before for the most part. Whoops. And so, that being said, 7 grams of NaCl, sodium chloride, are added to 2 liters of water. What is the boiling point? And so, uh, we know that we're going to end up having to use our delta Tf uh, is equal to, we said, the molality times uh, the uh, boiling point. Ah, not Tf, Tb. It's the boiling point we're looking for here. Delta Tb is equal to M times Kb times your Vantoff factor I. And so that's what we've got right here. Do we know what the change in the boiling point is? No, we don't. Doesn't say anything about that, except for that's what we're looking for. So delta TB is what we have here. The molality of the substance oh, it says we have 7 grams of NaCl are added to 2 liters of water. Uh, doesn't tell us the molality directly, but we can figure it out because molality, remember, is moles of solute over kilograms of solvent. And so um, we have how much NaCl? That's our solute. We have 7 grams. And so it's one of these cases where we're going to want to set up our, our uh, table here. 7 grams NaCl, 
set up our table going across here. We want to cancel out grams. We want to go to moles. To find that conversion, we're going to have to go over to the periodic table. And looking at that, we look at that sodium is 22.99. And so we take 22.99, which so one sodium plus chlorine, which looking at that up, you can see it's 35.45. And so from that, we get 58.44. And so we have 58.44 grams in one mole. And so to figure this out, moles, we'd say 7 times 1 divided by 58.44. And we end up with 0 0.1198. 1198 moles divided by the number of kilograms of water. And in this case right here, we have 2 liters. Uh, a liter is 1,000 milliliters. Uh, and remember, water has a density of 1 gram per milliliter in normal cases. And so 1,000 milliliters would be 1,000 grams. 1,000 grams is 1 kilogram. And so if I have 2 liters of water, that's just 2 kilograms of water. So it's this is a nice little thing to remember here. If you ever have a liter of water, that weighs a kilogram. 2 liters of water and it weighs 2 kilograms. And so that's what we've got now for our molality times Kb. Kb, since our, we are talking about we're adding this to water, it means we're going to use the, uh, the ebullioscopic uh, constant or the boiling point elevation constant for water, which is 0.512. And then times the number of pieces it wants to break into. NaCl is definitely ionic, definitely ionic. Uh, and so it's going to break into one sodium and one chlorine for a total of two pieces here. And so we take a two right here. And so if we go ahead and we work this out, we would say... We have our 0.1198 divided by 2, then times 0.512, then times 2 on that. And so I get uh, 0 0.06 if I am doing that right. And so I get in this case uh, for a total of delta Tb. Not a whole lot of raising in the temperature, which sort of makes sense. We only got 7 grams of salt. Uh, 0 0.06. One three degrees Celsius. Now, for our significant figures, is that you know the seven over here that's infinite. Uh, the two liters though has one significant figure, and that's going to sort of affect our things. So remember, our point five one two and our two for our i don't really make a difference. So this is going to be rounded to the hundredth space here. But the question asks for what the boiling asks you what the boiling point is. So to find the boiling point though, we have to look at the original boiling point of water, which is hundred degrees. And that 100 degrees is sort of defined to be exactly that. Um, that's what we're doing for the purpose of this class. And so if it's exactly that, then when we add our 0.06 to the 100, is that the 100 really isn't going to matter significant figure-wise. The only thing that's going to matter is going to be our 0.06. And so since that's rounded to the 100th space, then our final answer is also going to be rounded to the 100th space. And so uh, once we get an answer here, we will be, your final answer will be 100.06 degrees Celsius would be our final answer here. Because of the fact that our 0 0.06 is round to the hundredth space, and so when we add that to the hundred, which is exact, the hundred doesn't affect it, we just end up with 100.06 degrees Celsius for our new boiling point of our salt solution, our very, very dilute salt solution. So that's how you'd work that out. Next question. A sloppy chemist neglected to label a 3.0 molal iron chloride solution with the iron ion used. If the solution was found to have a boiling point of 104.6 degrees Celsius, what iron, what ion of iron was used? Uh, remember that iron comes in two flavors. It's plus, for its ions, it's either iron 2 or iron 3. And so remember, whenever we're writing these out, we wouldn't just want to write iron chloride. You'd want to write iron 2 chloride or iron 3 chloride. And in this particular problem, our chemists made a mistake, and they did not put that on there. Uh, they should have, but they didn't. So let's try to set this up. Is it's the way we're going to find out which type of iron ion is, we're going to basically boil it and look at what the boiling point is. And that's going to let us figure this out. And so let's take a look at how we do that. So it says we have a boiling point of 104.6 degrees Celsius. Since this is in water, we know the normal boiling point of water is 100. And so then delta Tb, the change in the boiling point, would just be 4.6. And so we say 4.6 is going to be equal to the molality. Do we know the molality? Ah, it tells us right here. Don't have to calculate it. So it's a 3.0 molal solution times Kb. And since we are dissolving this in water, Kb will be 0.512. And Van Toff factor. Hmm. We got a little issue here because if this is iron 2 chloride, 
then this will be FeCl2. If it's iron 3 chloride, it'll be FeCl3. We don't know which one of these this is. FeCl2 breaks into three pieces. FeCl3 breaks into four pieces. So we really don't know what I is. So I guess we're just going to solve for I here. It's the only thing we're missing anyway. And so to do this, we'd want to basically to solve for I, just take 4.6. And from that, divide that by 3.0 and divide that by 0.512. And so we take 4.6 divided by 3 and then divided by 0.512. And in doing so, I get 2.994 from a value of i. And so if i equals 2.9 Nine, four. That's pretty much, remember i has to be a whole number. It's pretty clear that's going to be 3 for our value of i here. So i has to basically equal 3. And if i equals 3, I have my two choices. Is it FeCl2 or FeCl3? FeCl2 would break into three pieces, while FeCl3 would break into four pieces. So we know that it has to be our FeCl2 over here. That's got to be what we're, what we're dealing with here. And so if it's FeCl2, then this has to end up being iron 2, so iron 2 chloride. And so the ion of iron here would be just Fe2+. And so that's how you'd work that out. That's a little more of a non-standard one, but what you can see is you can use these techniques to find things that otherwise you might not be able to get to easily. And so that's basically how you'd work out some basic boiling point elevation problems.